This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasener formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more. Just head over to LMNT to find out. Or better still, go down to the show notes, click on the link, the sleep for performance link, to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well. You don't even need to send it back. So check it out at LMNT in the show notes. Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. Today I am joined by uh, Professor John Lescu. John, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. John, it's so good to have you on. I'm so um, I'm so looking forward to talking to you. I have a little bit of a confession to make. I've, I've um, spoken to some of your colleagues over the last few months and I've become somewhat fascinated by this area of sleep and animals. And I said to my wife at Christmas whilst we were having a break, I said, you know what, if I had to kind of step laterally into another field, I think sleep and birds might be the way I go. I said, I'm not sure why, but I get so excited talking to these people about sleep and birds. It's a fascinating area. But interesting enough, which we'll talk about probably a little bit more today, it's actually um, had some overlap into my own work where I consult with mining companies and oil and gas companies around sleeping environments and design of camps and in these remote locations. So lots of complementary work. So it's um it's very interesting. Yeah. But but anyway, um John, we're going to get to lots of things I want to talk to you today. I have got no structure because I looked at all your research and I was like, oh my God, where do I start? We got sleeping magpies, we got sleeping sharks, we got sleeping marsupials, purpose of sleeping animals, measuring sleeping animals, artificial light, jellyfish and sleep ostriches and platypuses in sleep so there's so many things which we probably won't even cover half of today but i will put the link to all of john's papers in there and it's fascinating field but before we dive into that john tell us a little bit about yourself where you grew up um you know what led you into this area of kind of animals and sleep would like to give the listeners a little bit of uh, inside knowledge on you yeah, so as the as the accent might betray, I'm not Australian, but I'm rather from Canada. Um, and during my undergraduate degree, I studied zoology, and I was always really surprised that in a zoology degree where you're learning about animal behavior, comparative physiology, evolution, <clears throat> you never hear anything about sleep. And as a student, this really surprised and kind of disappointed me because some animals like humans spend one third of their lives asleep. So if you live to be 75 years old, which we hope you will, 25 years, 20, 25 years of that, you'll spend um, in the state of sleep. Mm -hmm. And some animals actually sleep more than they are awake. Um, and so sleep is a really important state in, in all species that have been studied. And yet, despite this, I was always a little struck that it was not covered in undergraduate degrees. So I endeavored then to study it in, in postgraduate studies where I went down to the United States and then on to Germany after that. Um, and then every, every move I made, I kept going further and farther east until I settled <laughs> in Melbourne. Now, I don't think I can go any further <clears throat> until I start back where I, I, I or where I where I started. But um, but yeah, I'm really fascinated by sleep in animals, the diversity of sleep behavior and physiology that we see in different kinds of animals, 
and understanding what sleep does. After all, this is a state that you spend so much time in, you look forward to doing it, you suffer when you don't do it. Mm. Um, and yet people have a really poor understanding about what this state actually does. And that stands in contrast with other things you do, like eating or having sex. You know why you're doing these things. But sleep, you voluntarily enter this period of profound vulnerability. You don't know why you are doing it. And that really sets sleep apart from any other animal behavior that I can think of. So pre-university uh, and degree, John, you said you grew up in Canada. Whereabouts in Canada did you grow up? Uh, a town called Hamilton, Ontario. It's also known as the Hammer. Uh, it's a it's a steel <laughs> town. Steel towns. It's like the Pittsburgh or the, of, of, uh, of Canada, is it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, was there anything in your sort of, in your adolescence or young childhood that sort of maybe made you think about sleep or was it just when you went to university? Did you ever have any fascination with sleep or the night or fairy tales or the darkness or was there any sort of inkling of this in your early childhood? I have a, I had a friend named Chris Hillenyluk who's now at the University of Minnesota. So this may embarrass him. And he uh, he had the most bizarre sleep patterns where he could become sleepless for long periods of time. He could stay up till two in the morning and sleep well into the afternoon. He could wake up quite early. He could have midday naps. He seemed to exhibit every possible sleep pattern that you could do with an <laughs> individual in short periods of time. And uh, early on, I thought, how is it that that someone can do this, this kind of plasticity in their sleep patterns, which I think led to my interest in studying the plasticity that animals have in the timing and the amount of sleep in response to, say, predation risk, um, light pollution, uh, or the breeding season. Mm -hmm. Now, some people might be saying, was your friend taking lots of drugs when he was young, or was this just normal behavior? He was an odd one. Yeah, he had a normal <laughs> behavior. I don't know where he is now, but uh, or what he's doing now. But I wonder if it's still strange. Yeah, well, he could be a bit like um, he didn't get into physics, did he? By any chance? No. No microbiology. Microbiology. Okay. Yeah, because I know like um, Einstein was a was a classic. Uh, well, to say he was anyway, I don't know if it's true. But like a, a polyphasic sleep, like multiple sleep periods across twenty four hour periods. So sounds like your friend was sort of on that polyphasic side of anything. Yeah, so, that's, um, that's yeah. and also also Donald Trump was purported to get by with very little sleep. So I don't know whether that favors an important hypothesis for the function of sleep or diminishes it. But anyway, that's well, like, I, I, I think that Donald Trump is a classic example of somebody that can get by on six hours and not make mistakes. Like, you yes. know, you can really see that his performance has not been impacted by that's it. So right. that's that's a testament to like getting by on less than six hours of sleep and I flawless behavioral decision making. <laughs> <laughs> editor note that was sarcasm <laughs> in case anybody's going what is wrong with these people <laughs> it's really your sarcasm there <laughs> so so john um you started getting into sleep um like you said after looking at zoology was there any sort of mentors in the field at this stage or was it largely unexplored like how who kind of supported you to take this direction and look at this more in more detail yeah at the time in the early 2000s there weren't many people working on comparative aspects of sleep. So I had visited many labs in the United States and in Canada, trying to find a supervisor for, at the time, my master's degree. Um, but there were really very few people. Most research that's done in the sleep field at the time, and look, even still, is, is clinically oriented. So it, yeah. it's really designed mm -hmm. around human sleep disorders. Yeah. And the work that is done on non-human animals is done on mice for basic sleep research, but outside of humans and laboratory bred rodents, there really wasn't much uh, available. So I had visited some labs to try to fit myself in with groups that weren't studying sleep, but maybe kind of could. Um, and ultimately I came across one lab in Indiana, <clears throat> Indiana State University, which was run by uh, Charles Amlaner, who's now retired, and Steve Lima, who's sadly also now retired, and Steve's a behavioral ecologist. Uh, Charlie was a sleep physiologist. And between the two of them, I was able to look at um, how, the, how predators shape sleep in prey, that because sleep is such a vulnerable state, 
that animals are doing that predators probably have had an outsized role in shaping that state over evolutionary time. And uh, so we explored that by comparing how I think 80 different species of mammals sleep in terms of the total amount of time and the composition of that sleep. And then we found that one particular sleep state called rapid eye movement sleep, that REM sleep was reduced in animals that were subjected to higher risks of predation. Um, we then explored this within a species, scaring wild rats in the lab and found the same result in their sleep, that they REM sleep was particularly knocked out. And this is probably due to REM sleep being a very deep form of sleep. So it making it a particularly dangerous kind of sleep, at least from an anti-predator point of view. So that's how I got started really because of the efforts of Charles Amlander and Steve Lima. They set me on a path um, for a lifelong career in sleep research. That's a very interesting uh, point about the suppression or the inability to get into REM or stay in REM if you're kind of under attack. And I wonder if the same thing is, is true for humans. Yeah, indeed it is. So if you sleep in a a new environment for the first time, you crash on a friend's couch or mm. someone you don't know very well their couch, um, or you're sleeping in a hotel room that you've never been in before, there's a very well-known phenomenon called the first night effect, mm. where your sleep is more fragmented and importantly, it is reduced in the deeper forms of sleep. So this is so well known that if you do a sleep study in a hospital, you don't do one night of sleep because of that first night is odd. You do two or three nights and they really only look at the second and the third night mm -hmm. of sleep because of this first night effect. Yeah, it's interesting. So when you looked at all, like you said, 80 mammals, to give us a bit of kind of some outer markers, um, was there one animal that slept the least in a 24 hour period and one hour, what, what animal kind of slept the most? And I think I might have read this paper a long time ago. Is it true that giraffes are sort of on the lower end of the spectrum, like 1.8 hours a day or something like that, or 2.8, something like that? That's right. Um, so, that, that is true. So, so in the case of giraffes and elephants, these are animals that sleep just a couple of hours per 24 hour day. Now, those measurements are based upon behavior. So not looking at brain activity, but just the animal is doing behaviors that we think of as sleep yeah. like. Um, however, when you look at cows and horses <clears throat> and sheep, these large farm animals, they also sleep three, four, maybe five hours per 24 hour day, but very low amounts of sleep. Um, so it seems that large herbivores are at one end of this sort of um, spectrum continuum. And then at the other end, well, you have small mammals, things like a Mexican volcano mouse or a collared lemming or a ground squirrel. Uh, these are animals that are sleeping uh, 18, 19 hours. Armadillo, wow. about 20 hours per 24 hour day of sleep. Um, so these are animals that sleep much, much more than they are awake. Um, so sleep is their predominant state that they are in. So is this got to do with the fact that they're maybe so small that they can hide in places where are not going to have predators. Is there any of those sort of factors that are linked to this or is it just completely their sleep, but their biological need for sleep each day? Yeah, it's not, it's not clear how it relates to sleep function. Um, but we do know that these really small animals have particularly high uh, metabolic rates and that there is undoubtedly an energy conservation function for sleep that sleep does save energy and it can save energy in a couple of different ways. One, it saves energy because when you're sleeping, you're not doing something else, mm. like, like talking to you and holding your thumb up, which takes energy. Yeah. To, so you save energy by not doing something else. Um, but you also save energy because your metabolic rate is lower during sleep. Um, so the small animals have really high metabolic rates. They have to eat a lot uh, relative for their size and probably a way to to save additional energy is to sleep a lot. Um, they eat and sleep. Those are their two main behaviors. A bit like me when I was a teenager. That's right. <laughs> as well. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, it's so funny. Like, you, you know, you're a teenager. Like, I can't wait. I grow up till I do what I want. Then when you're an adult, you're like, I wish I was a teenager to sit around eating and watch TV. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, John, just before Christmas, as it was Christmas special on the podcast, we interviewed a lady called Melanie Fuhrer, not could be pronouncing that wrong, F-U-R-R-E-R, 
or ER. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's from Germany, but did some research up in Norway. I don't know if you've come across this, but she actually looked at sleep in reindeers. Mm. I don't know if you've seen this. It was, I, I think she's right on the publication, but she had an abstract at uh, European Sleep last year. That's how I was put in touch with her. Um, and Melanie um, had this really interesting where she like basically super glued EEG onto these reindeers and looked at sleep. But she talked about in her research that she came up with kind of t- there was obviously sleep, but then there was this kind of like rumination period across the day. Do you see this kind of rumination period where it's like a kind of a form of sleep whilst they're, you know, chewing on the chewing on the grass or doing other activity? Do you see this just in kind of cows and reindeer and other stuff or do you see this in other animals? And is is that sleep or is it different than sleep? And can you can you maybe discuss that if you if you have any info on that one? Yeah. So first, I haven't seen the paper, but thanks for the heads up because I'm going to look for this now. Um, I was doing some covert searching while you were talking. My apologies. I I, 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 I can send you the link. So we're looking at the very same thing. Yeah, that would be lovely. Um, now, I, I don't think it's a published paper. I just put it in the chat there as we're as we're talking. But um, this was I put the abstract for what she had on the poster in there. So you can have a look at the abstract. I believe the, the full paper might be under review or was getting submitted. Yeah. So, um, but you can see there on the show notes some of the stuff I put in there from this conversation. It was fascinating, like to talk about this. Seeing it was Christmas as well, I thought it was just a bit of a novelty. But she, um, Melanie was saying this was the first study that looked at objective sleep in renders. Other studies had done what you spoke about, behavioral or actigraphy based, looking at periods of movement or non movement, like we have with Fitbits. But this was the first time that I had wanted to look at sort of, uh, you know, these electrophysiology markers from the brain um, mm-hmm. of these animals. So it's quite, quite fascinating, I thought. Yeah, and it's interesting what you said about their rumination, because this is known from other <clears throat> other ruminants, that is other animals that sort of burp up some of their partially digested food to chew it again, and then swallow it. Um, Teen- teenagers again. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> so so other, other ruminants, um, like uh, cows and sheep, they ruminate, obviously, while they're awake. Um, They can also ruminate when they're in one of two sleep states, that is when they're in a slow wave sleep, which is also known as non-rapid eye movement sleep. Um, They can continue to chew their cud um, during slow wave sleep. Their eyes are sort of half open, half closed. They're kind of like in this drowsy middle middle ground between sleep and wakefulness. Mm -hmm. And they continue to chew, but when the animals enter REM sleep, um, the loss of muscle tone seems to prevent them from chewing the cud yeah. um, anymore. So they stop. I wonder, um, you know, just speculatively, is this similar to what we see? And we have a limitation in this area still uh, in terms of how people who do a lot of meditation or go on meditation retreats often discuss or, or report that they need less sleep. Hmm. And, I, and I wonder as well, is it something got to do with the meditation during the day is having a similar kind of effect? Or is it because we have so much stress, so much activity during the day mm-hmm. that sort of like, you know, like thinking about like a ledger, the more inputs we have on one side, the more outputs we need on the other, which kind of goes into the, um, that probably just makes sense, that analogy, but it's kind of like a bit like you just want that perfect balance. And we've spoken about this before in athletes where, you know, there's no such thing as really as, um, on, as, as um, overtraining, there's just under recovery. So mm-hmm. if you allow enough time, you 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 will be fine. You'll have that kind of balance, you know. So I just wonder, you know, speculatively, is this what might happen in humans when it, to have this kind of downtime and allow for this kind of meditative state, which would be kind of like an early state of rumination or deep rest where they're not actually doing anything, but they've kind of just dialed everything down and they're in this kind of in-between state. Yeah. So we we do know that um what determines when you get tired. Um, so there's a, f- a few factors that determine when you when you're tired. So of course, one of the more obvious ones would be simply the time of day that when you wake up in the morning, um, you're not very tired. You're not tired because your circadian clock is telling you that it's time to wake yeah. up and do something. Um, and then around bedtime, you get tired, not just because it's late, but your your body clock is telling you that it's it's late and it's time for you to go to sleep. And of course, if you stay awake and have a really poor night's sleep on an airplane, and then if you can just make it till about five o'clock in the morning on that plane, you're you start to feel quite alert, even mm. though you've slept so poorly that, yeah. that night sitting in a chair. But you've made it, and now your circadian clock takes over, and you're able to be somewhat alert. So that's your circadian clock regulating when you sleep. The other one is um, how much sleep you had before. If you had a lot of sleep, obviously you're not tired anymore. But it isn't, and this gets to your point, it isn't just about how 
long you were awake, but it's also the intensity of that wake. So if you're doing things that are neurologically demanding, things that use your brain quite a lot, um, or, uh, you know, you have really intense interactions, maybe these are uh, uh, reproductive related interactions, we'll say, um, then you accrue a greater sleep need, and this can cause you then to have more intense sleep at night. So what you do while awake influences your subsequent sleep and sleep patterns. Mm, interesting. So, um, John, we, we discussed there like sort of low sleepers. We uh, discussed high sleepers in terms of different animals. A couple of things that might be uh, are of interest to me is, um, and I didn't see any research on your profile that you might have done this, but I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it. How do kind of our, our cousins sleep down the road, the bonobos, the chimpanzees and all this? Is this something you've ever had interest in or looked at from a, from a, from the outside? Yeah, I've looked into it and so have some other folks. Um, so when you look at some of the closest living relatives, like non-human primates, um, things like chimpanzees, things like bonobos, uh, their sleep is very similar to our own. Um, so outside of humans, we typically just say, if you're a non-human animal, you have slow wave sleep and you have rapid eye movement sleep. But within humans, um, non-REM sleep is broken up into three different states. You have non-REM sleep one, non-REM sleep two, which has uh, sleep spindles, K-complex, complexes, yeah. different waveforms, and then stage three non-REM sleep, which is these big high amplitude uh, slow waves. Now, outside of humans, we just say they have non-REM sleep, and it's pretty much just high amplitude slow waves may or may not have um, these other um, waveforms in them. However, chimpanzees seem to have some sleep states that are in, in some ways pr probably evolutionary homologous to that in, in humans. And on top of that, people have also looked at activity patterns, um, not electrophysiology, but activity patterns of um, pre-industrial uh, tribes of humans. So living in South America, living in Africa, and the interest there was to provide insight into an ongoing debate about whether or not modern humans are sleep deprived. Are we living in an urbanized world? Are we chronically sleep deprived because we're staying up later because of electric lights? We're waking up early because of the demands associated with work, dropping kids off at school, checking electronic devices all the time. Um, does this make us a chronically sleep deprived society? And this group from California led by Jerry Siegel put on something like Fitbits, like actigraphy mm. monitors on, on pre-industrialized um, um, populations of humans and found that paradoxically, these groups of humans were actually sleeping less than, than urbanized humans. Um, they also typically were bimodal in their sleep. So they would go to bed early with, with the sun set and they would stay asleep for a few hours. And then in the middle of the night, they would wake up. And if they had a fire, they would do things. Um, if they had astronomical sources of light, they could do things. And after a period of time, they would go back to sleep and then wake up. But they were only sleeping five, six hours, um, unlike the eight hours that we recommend that, that you and I get. Um, so this was a real paradox, but it did suggest that perhaps we are not so chronically sleep deprived as some people think. But again, John, I wonder if this circle back to the argument about stress. And I, I haven't seen too much on this about the ability to quantify stress. In a, in, because you mentioned things like dropping kids off, checking phones and so on. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people in the Amazon or people in Papua New Guinea or in these areas have got that daily stress that we have. And the yeah. other thing as well is when you look at even act activity movements of these people, they're sort of ambling along all the day. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not sort of sitting stationary, sitting there like checking emails and having people come into them. They're not getting these artificial spikes of cortisol during the day from someone being an asshole to them in an office mm -hmm. um, or someone driving up on top of them, whatever. They're sort of ambling, they're hunting, they're gathering. Mm -hmm. It's pretty chilled. A lot of times sitting around, you know, sort of looking up at the sky, contemplating life, like you said about looking at the stars at night. Yeah. And I, and I wonder again, how much of this, and it'd be so hard to quantify for each person, but how much is stress impacting our sleep like this? Because I'm sure many of us, would have experienced over the holidays. Like we're, we're in late January now and kind of stress levels are probably increasing for people. But people just take two or three weeks off over Christmas. You get into this kind of Zen state after four or five days and then you feel kind of peaceful for 10 or 12 days. 
And then it starts gradually ramping up as you come back. And then by the end of January around now, people are like, I can see people humming again. Like you can feel it, like getting amped up and amped up. Yeah. So again, I just wonder, are we kind of coming full circle on that kind of point about the sleep need for humans? Yeah, look, it, it would be really interesting to look at the effects of, of stress on human sleep, or like around the the, the 12 month, a uh, full 12 month rhythm, wouldn't it? Um, mm. to see how sleep changes and, and to even control for changes in day length, whereas people yeah. in tend to sleep less than um, people in winter, which sleep more. Um, so if you could control for the effects of changes in day length and just focus on stress effects, I think that would be interesting, actually. I'm, I'm not aware of studies on that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, n- neither have I. It's interesting. John, do you know if, um, talk about primates again there, do you know if primates sleep in the same habits as humans as in terms of duration per day? Similar amounts. Similar, similar amounts. Similar of, amounts. That's right. As, yeah. as in pre-industrial people or modern people, if I missed that, sorry. I, I'm talking about non-human primates now. Um, yeah. Um, but there are exceptions. Some things like uh, squirrel monkeys. I think there's one called a night monkey. I, I feel like I got that wrong. Um, vervets, they, they tend to sleep longer, 12, okay. 13 hours per night if memory serves. Yeah. Now, the big question, John, which I am, I, I want to dig into a little bit here is because people, somebody's probably listening to this going, how in the name of God do they measure sleep on monkeys, you know, dolphins, jellyfish, whatever it might be? So can you talk us through the hierarchy of sleep methodology that you would use on these animals? Okay. So because I'm sure you don't admit them into a lab do you, and do paperwork. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So humans are really good about listening to instructions. So if you, if you go into a sleep clinic, maybe you think you have sleep apnea, something like that, bruxism, and you want to get diagnosed, you go into a sleep clinic And they'll wire you up for a polysomnographic analysis where you'll have wires coming off of every part of your body, basically. And you'll be a tangled mess. And they tell you not to touch these. And you don't because you can listen. Um, However, in non-human animals, this is, of course, much harder to do. So you have to be a little bit more invasive in terms of where you put the electrodes and how secure you put the electrodes. So in the case of mammals, birds, uh, non-avian reptiles, the the standard way to do these type of surgeries, and they are rather invasive, is um, you seat the electrodes on the surface of the brain. So these type of procedures involve a surgery. The animal is placed under an anesthetic. They're given various drugs, um, anti-inflammatories, long-lasting painkillers, And you uh, drill holes through the cranium to the level of the dura. And the dura is this membrane that's covering the brain. So you don't penetrate the the dura. You don't penetrate the brain. You just drill through the cranium. And when I say drill, I mean a very, very small hole that you see under magnification. And into that, you insert a little electrode, a little wire, um, often with a a gold pin on the end um, because it's, it's a good conductor. Um, And then you seal everything up using dental acrylic. You hold it in place, cement it to the cranium using dental acrylic. This is the same stuff that fake teeth are are made out of. Mm. Um, And in this way, the electrode becomes a permanent feature of the animal. It's largely unremovable at that point. And that's a good thing because you can get signals over weeks or months or years from an animal. Um, and also there's nothing that the animal can get tangled in or, or disrupt. And then to these electrodes that are, that are on the surface of their brain, you connect a little data logger. It's a little microchip about the size of my thumbnail. And you plug that in to a little plug on top of their head and it records brain activity. It can record muscle tone. It can record eye movements. Um, They also have a little accelerometer built into them. So you can resolve what the head is doing in three dimensions using this accelerometer. And in this way, you can characterize sleep of mammals, birds, reptiles um, to understand when they're awake and when they're asleep. Um, Outside of these types of animals, you have to be a bit more sophisticated in how you go about it because In some animals, they're soft bodied. So you don't have something to apply dental acrylic to hold an electrode in place. Can't stick an electrode in a jellyfish. 
Um, so in that case, we have to come up with other methods for characterizing sleep. The long-standing way that people have done this is using a behavioral characterization of sleep, where sleep is basically the conclusion when you have met a series of criteria. So one is restfulness. Mm -hmm. When you're sleeping and when a fruit fly is sleeping and when a flatworm is sleeping, they're all largely restful. They're periods of immobility, often prolonged periods of immobility, during which the animal assumes a, a, a recumbent posture, a relaxed posture. Um, if they have eyes, those eyes are typically closed. But as we talked about from the case of ruminants, this doesn't have to be the case. Also, birds tend to sleep with their eyes open. Um, so eye state is not a really good diagnostic feature of sleep or wakefulness in some animals. Um, perhaps the most important characteristic is that these periods of restfulness are associated with reduced responsiveness. So if I wanted to test whether you were sleeping right now, I might tap you gently with a stick and you'd probably respond readily. Don't hit me with that stick. <laughs> um, but if I tap you with the same gentle intensity at night, you're probably not going to respond because you have reduced responsiveness during the state. And that's really one of the main hallmarks of sleep. And then the last is that it's regulated. So if you lose sleep, if you stay up late tonight editing this podcast, then you might have a need to sleep in uh, tomorrow morning, or you might have deeper sleep um, tonight. Um, and when you've demonstrated these suite of traits from animals, you can conclude that um, a shark sleeps, flatworm sleeps, or a jellyfish sleeps. Mm. It's very interesting. So with the coming back to putting the um, you know, the electrodes in the in the animal through the drill into the cranium, is that something you do yourself as a researcher, or do you, is there specialized people who do that? I, I've been doing that for about um, I don't know, uh 15, 15 plus 20 years now, something like that. Um, so it's just sort of a, a skill that you pick up along the way. Although it sounds dreadful, um, and it does sound dreadful, I'll concede that, animals handle this very, very well. And, you know, they come out of the surgery and they preen and they eat. And male pigeons will immediately start displaying to a female in a neighboring aviary. Um, and they handle it far better than a human would. You know, if I get a, if I get my <laughs> wisdom teeth out, I'm probably going to be on the couch with ice cream for a week. But I found yeah. that birds particularly handle these things spectacularly well. And they just get on with what they were doing afterwards. It's quite remarkable. Mm, it's quite interesting. Yeah. And I think it's also worth saying as well that this research always has to get ethics. So it has to go through an ethics board. It's not just John going, hey, give me a pigeon there. I'll drill a hole in its head. It's actually, she has goes through a process that takes weeks, if not months to get approved. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not something that we can just do willy-nilly as researchers in case anybody is wondering. That's right. Between one and three permits, depending on the species. Yeah. 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 That's right. So, um, so yeah, this is this is fascinating about about measuring sleep in, in these animals. And like you said, it's great to hear that they rebound and get back. Because that's what I was going to ask you as well as how did it kind of go afterwards? But also then in birds, John, that might fly away or you know, they're moving about. Is this data coming back? Like, is it just kind of coming back via Wi-Fi? Do you have to recapture the animal to download the data? Can you look at it in real time? How does that part work? So in the case of um in the case of most birds, I typically work on them in the laboratory. So this is the case with Australian magpies. This is the case with pigeons, with starlings. Um, I've worked on these species all in the lab where they're housed in large aviaries. And uh, the birds are able to see uh, one another. So they have some social interactions in the case of Australian magpies. But the technology that's recording the brain waves is a data logger, meaning I catch the bird, I remove the data logger and download the data. Um, only in one study have I worked truly in the wild. And that was a study on pectoral sandpipers in Alaska, where we were working with, um, so the pectoral sandpiper, this is a small shorebird and it migrates from um, the Southern hemisphere to above the Arctic Circle to breed under continuous mm. daylight. And during that time, uh, the males have a lot to do. They have to set up territories, defend those territories, look out for predators. 
um, thwart rivals, um, and eat, of course. Um, and and they're busy courting females and hooting as they do. They they fly these these um, circular flight paths and they hoot along the way. Hoot 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 hoot. And um, and so some colleagues of ours in Germany, led by uh, Bart Kempeners, who's the director of the Max Planck Institute for Biological Intelligence, he had very nice activity data that suggested that these males become what he thought of as sleepless during this time, that they were basically continuously active during the breeding season. And so this was a system where we could not catch birds and bring them into captivity because that might, that might change their state. They might just lose this drive if they don't have fertile females around them anymore. So we had to work on these birds in the wild. But fortunately for us, the males were had high fidelity for their territories. So you could catch them, you could do a surgery on them, you could put them back on their territories, and they would immediately start fighting males and mm -hmm. courting females. Um, and this is all in the wild. This is all in the wild. And... Um, quite remarkable, really. I mean, we actually had one animal, one male, who we did a surgery on, we released the birds. And then as soon as we released the bird, another male came in to challenge him. And they flew a, they flew a high altitudinal flight, a competitive flight straight up into the air at the level of the clouds. And we lost them. And when they came back down, it was our boy who won. And um, so we feel fairly confident that these birds are not compromised in any way by this ability, by this, um, by this, by this surgery. But what we were able to show was that the males, some of these males had a remarkable ability to become virtually sleepless during this time, confirmed by electrophysiology, sleeping very, very little per 24 hour day, about 10% per 24 hour day and doing it for about three weeks. Wow. So remarkable. Do you know that when they went back down to, you know, South America, that did they, did they go back up like, you know, X amount of sleep? Was there like a re rebound effect from this? Yeah, we would love to know. So um, when the birds uh, are outside of the breeding season, so that includes just when the females are now incubating their young or their eggs, rather, um, the males lose their territories and they switch to a foraging mode and they are no longer approachable in any way. So while really? we can capture and recapture the animals when they're territorial, man, we cannot um, when the fir the the, feet the fir females are no longer available. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know the answer to this question. It would be lovely. In order to do that, we would need a transmitter. Um, so something that can send the EEG data to yeah, a yeah. hub or a base station. And given the birds are about 100 grams, I, I don't believe any technology is available to allow us to do that at this point. The data is very dense with big file sizes. Yeah, and, um, I'm not aware of anything that would actually let us do it at this time, but things are always getting smaller. Yeah, this is very interesting. And before we delve into some other specific animals, uh, we, I suppose after we've uh, spoken about the skies, we might jump to the sea in a moment. But sure. John, some people might be stopping here and going, what is the point of this? What is the point of looking at animals? Surely we've got bigger problems to solve in the world. You said about human sleep problems, challenges, you know, there's people out there doing shift work, they've got medical issues, we've had coronavirus, we've had pandemics, and you're out there looking at birds. Like, what is the point of this research? Some people might be asking themselves. How, what, so what, how would you justify, not even justify, because I don't think you have to justify, but how would you say, how would you kind of maybe sell or tell us what the benefit of doing this research is for us as a society? So um, I'm I'm fairly biased in my view of this. <laughs> um, but but how many species are there in the world? Nine nine million species, something like this, that we think of, and humans are but one. And just in the in the few species that we've looked at so far, we see amazing adaptations to permit sleep under what we would think of as inhospitable conditions. Some animals can sleep while flying. Some animals can sleep while swimming. Humans have tried to sleep while driving, although that's less adaptive than their approach. Um, but there are phenomenal and elegant strategies for animals to sleep while doing other things. Um, 
This indicates by itself that sleep must be doing something very important. It's probably the best evidence that we have that sleep is doing something very, very important for the brain. Um, and I'd like to give an example showing very nicely how sleep can profoundly change how we think of sleep in ourselves. So in the 1970s, a group from Russia um, looked at dolphins. And they said, this is a mammal. This is something that respires atmospheric oxygen. Um, it needs to keep its blowhole above the surface, but I guess it needs to breathe uh, and sleep as well. So how does it go about doing this? So they implanted these animals with electrodes for recording brain activity. And they identified a new kind of sleep that we call unihemispheric slow wave sleep, where these animals slept with one half of their brain at a time. Not only did they sleep with one half of their brain at a time, but they kept one eye open and one eye closed, unilateral eye closure. So the eye associated with the awake hemisphere was open and the eye associated with the asleep hemisphere is closed. And so sleep then was not this global whole brain phenomenon. We think of sleep as a behavioral shutdown that you go to sleep and everything sort of ceases. It's a whole brain affair. And for a long time, this is how sleep was viewed as a global state. Mm -hmm. But this work on cetaceans uh, revealed that sleep was a local process. And indeed, since then, we now know that sleep can occur locally in the brain, including the human brain, not to the extreme extent of unihemispheric sleep. But we know that different brain regions sleep for different periods of time, and some brain regions wake up seemingly before others. Um, so we know that sleep is actually a set of, a series of local processes occurring in the brain. And that, um, I hate to use the word paradigm shift because it sounds pompous, but that change, that profound change in how we think about sleep that occurred um, really in the, in around the year 2000, um, came about because somebody said, how does a dolphin sleep? And you would have never thought at the time that somebody asking that question, how does a dolphin sleep, would have any relevance for sleep in humans. But it was one of the most important discoveries actually the field has ever made. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think John, we could ever replicate that with humans? Uh, people have done similar things. So you know how I mentioned there was a first night effect when you go into an unfamiliar place like a hotel room and you sleep. Yeah. Um, so a, a group uh, tried to see whether or not humans were capable of like a unihemispheric like sleep state. You're in a new environment. Does one half of your brain, um, is it sleeping deeper than the other? And they even presented that sleeping subject with acoustic stimuli to see whether or not they could get a response. And just as they expected, one hemisphere slept deeper than the other, and the hemisphere that was sleeping lighter responded more readily to acoustic stimulation than the other hemisphere. So this isn't unihemispheric sleep, but it is indicating that there are asymmetries, differences within a brain at the same time in the depth of sleep. So we are doing something unihemispheric like. Um, so, so this this might actually humans. This might complement, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy called Ian McGilchrist. No. Ian McGilchrist wrote um, this book called The Master and His Emissary. Mm -hmm. And he wrote two books as well called The Matter with Things. And they're absolutely phenomenal sorry, books. Um, let me just grab them here because they're absolutely, they're bigger than the Bible. Yeah, okay. <laughs> They're like that. The matter with things, uh, part one and part two. Okay, he had a lot Mass to say. I guess it's books. on all things, though, isn't it? Well, he's actually just concentrating on the brain. It's all about the brain. It's all about left versus right hemisphere, what you're talking about there, and uh -huh. about how the left is very analytical. And then, you know, we have become more kind of left brain dominant over the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, he argues against the fact that people would say, you know, oh, that guy's just left, left hemispheric dominant, whatever it might be, and he's right brain. But you actually have the two. And he's got another book that precedes this called The Master and His Emissary, which is about this kind of um, two sides of the brain. Mm -hmm. But he, in this, obviously, and I 
I'm only about like a tenth of the way through the first book because I've got like 50 different books that I've read at one time. But anyway, yeah, and I've listened to lots of his lectures. Mm-hmm. A very interesting guy. I can put a link in the show notes. Yeah, it'd be lovely. But but he talks about these kind of coincidence of opposites, you know, like how a tree needs like resistance to get stronger, wind and rain and, you know, heat and so on. We we just can't always have these kind of perfect conditions for everything. Mm-hmm. And um, in this book, he talks a little bit, he, you just remind me of him in terms of like the both sides of their brain and the left being very analytical and the right, like looking for meaning and looking at the big picture. Mm-hmm. My question back is, John, and I don't know if the, if you noticed know from this research or not, but was the left side of the hemisphere, the left hemispheric side, was that more responsive than the right, I wonder, or even has that been looked at? Because this would maybe indicate, you know, which side is more dominant during these different stages of sleep and okay. what's like more looking out. So it's true that in this study, they were testing only one of the two hemispheres, but I forget which one it was. I believe it was the right hemisphere was sleeping more lightly, uh, meaning that the left was more deep. But I I am hesitant to commit too much to saying this, actually. The one thing I like about this podcast, John, is the one thing I hear about this podcast. It just leads me to more questions and more study ideas. <laughs> it's, a good and thing. it's like, well, no, it's great. I'm just, I'm just joking, but it does. It's, um, you know, it's, it's like recently on a radio show in Australia. The guy said to me afterwards, "What's wrong with you guys? You can never answer a question. You're always like, it depends, or we have to do this, or we have to do that." I'm like, well, that's science, my friend. There is no, there is no full stop. And if anybody, like the phrase that drives me mad, and I've said this on this podcast and other ones, is the science is settled. That drives me around the twist because the science has never settled. It should be, this is what we know now. However, that's mm-hmm. really what it should be, you know? Yeah. The, the science was settled when we thought the um, the earth was at the center of the solar system. <laughs> I use that example as well. Yeah. Yeah. And Galileo was like burnt, you know, right? so, <laughs> <laughs> and we figured out that wasn't settled. And then people got, mm, yeah, you're right. Actually, we should um, hmm, maybe. So, yeah. Um, let's uh, let's delve under the sea, John, now. And um, what fascinates me about the ocean is that from a recent podcast I was listening to oh, probably about a year and a half ago on a, a science podcast called The Infinite Monkey Cage. I don't know if you've ever heard of that podcast by Brian Cox. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people complain that the fact that you have a podcast called The Infinite Monkey Cage is not right because monkeys are then locked in a cage. But the fact that it's infinite would be a circular argument to that. However, they had an episode on oceans and it struck me I was so surprised. We know about 2% of what goes on in the oceans. We know more about outer space. We know more about the moon than we know about the oceans on the planet that we inhabit, yeah. which was absolutely mind blown. Mm-hmm. But you've looked at some animals in here or some that get into water. And we'll start with the animal that first people didn't even think existed back in the 1920s and thought it was a joke was the platypus. They thought it was a met up animal. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So what, what's going on with these platypus? How do, how do they sleep or do they sleep? And are they real, John? <laughs> so, the, so, so the platypus is found in, in freshwater s- systems around um, uh, Victoria, Tasmania, um, Queensland, New South Wales. And um, their sleep was studied by a fellow named Jerry Siegel. And he uh, was interested in the platypus because these are mammals, but they're egg laying. So uh, it's they retain some traits that are thought to have been inherited from a reptilian ancestor, notably egg laying. Mm-hmm. So it's thought, well, if they retained those traits, then perhaps they retained other reptilian traits as well, perhaps related to their sleep. Um, so he was interested in looking at the evolution of mammalian sleep states. Where did slow wave sleep and REM sleep come from? The the data from reptiles at the time was really inconsistent. Um, It's still somewhat confusing. And so he thought that monotremes would provide insight into this. So he studied not just the platypus, but also the short-beaked echidna. Um, And he did so electrophysiologically. And he found that unlike all other mammals studied, these monotremes, they had slow wave sleep and REM sleep, but these were co- occurring simultaneously in different parts of the brain. So REM sleep was occurring in the brain stem, whereas slow wave sleep was occurring in the forebrain. And this stood in marked contrast to any other mammal that we had known, where you have slow wave sleep and REM sleep occurring at different times. Um, They're temporally isolated, distinct states. And so it led Jerry to suggest then 
that perhaps these states originated as a single sleep state, and then with the appearance of marsupial and eutherian mammals diverged into these um, two independent sleep states. And consistent with that approach, or that, excuse me, that conclusion, we studied um, ostriches a number of years ago in South Africa. Sorry if this is taking us away from aquatic habitats. That's okay. We can, we'll, we'll dive down again. It's okay. We can, Thank you. We can, we can, yeah. we can be, like a, be like a submarine. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and, um, and we wanted to study ostriches because these are members of uh, a group called the Paleonathae that are thought to be in some way primitive birds. They return, retain reptilian features. Um, their sperm structure is more similar to crocodiles than it is to other birds. And so like the rationale for studying monotremes, it was thought that maybe they too um, would have similar sleep patterns that were indicative of a reptilian ancestor. And when we had done this study, we, we really didn't expect to find anything monotreme-like, but actually we that's exact, exactly what we found. We found that they had slow wave sleep occurring in their forebrain and REM sleep that seemed to be occurring in their brainstem at the same time. And there's a video on YouTube uh, showing what this, what this looks like, actually, where the animal has its head held up like a, the periscope on a submarine, appropriately enough, and their eyes are open and they're motionless. And people in the past have thought that they were awake and vigilant. Not at all. Brain activity shows that these are very much in slow wave sleep. And then they close their eyes, they lose muscle tone, and their head starts to dance a little bit. And then they recover and uh, re-enter slow wave sleep. Um, however, those sleep states are unusual in that you can have slow waves and REM sleep occurring at the same time in different parts of the brain. So it seemed at the time that monotremes, paleonath birds, um, convergently evolved this, or, or inherited from a reptilian ancestor, this bizarre sleep state. Um, the, the situation gets a little bit more complex and confusing, I suppose, because we went then went on to study a, another bird called a tinamou from South America. And that bird, unlike an ostrich, is small. And it's flighted, which is thought to be more representative of early birds when they diverged from dinosaurs. And those their sleep is is unremarkable in the sense that it just looks like bird the sleep that you would get from a starling or a pigeon or a sandpiper. Um, so so it's a little bit more complex than that. But nevertheless, there is something about being an ostrich and something about being a platypus that means your brain sleeps in the same very bizarre way. Mm. And what about emus, John? Are they, are they similar as well to ostriches and how they are? So a colleague of mine has has collected but not published that data, in fact, and he tells me that they sleep the same as an ostrich. Um, they have this weird mixed state. Um, so I hope he publishes that this year um, because I'd, I'd love to see it. Yeah, it's very, it's fascinating. Yeah. All right, let's dive, let's let's uh, let's dive back down. Um, okay. You, we mentioned uh, <laughs> dive, dive. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, we've seen the hatches. Um, you mentioned dolphins a moment ago. Now, I'm here in Perth in Western Australia. I spend a lot of time swimming in the ocean. I love getting into the ocean. And uh, what scares the living shit out of me in the ocean is my old friend that I don't like to say the word. And when we go swimming, I say to people, do not say that word. It's like Voldemort and Harry Potter. It's do true. not say the word. But we have to say it today, sharks, John. How do these sharks sleep? What goes on? And is it different between species like tiger sharks or reef sharks to gray whites? Um, any difference between them? And, and what's going on? Are they, out there, are they out there not sleeping, hunting us night and day? Or what's really happening with these sharks in the water? So before I, I get into the data, let me just explain that there's sort of two main groups of sharks that you can think of. Um, one is known as a, a, a buccal pumping shark. So all this means is that in order to ventilate their gills with oxygen-rich seawater, these buccal pumping sharks are able to take seawater into their mouth, into their buccal cavity, and swallow it, that pushes it, in a sense, over their gills. And because they're pumping seawater, actively over their gills. These sharks are able to remain motionless for extended periods of time. So you might see uh, white-tipped reef sharks 
that are sitting on the sea floor. They sometimes get together in groups even. Um, perhaps these animals are sleeping, but they're they're forcing water over their gills, and this affords them this nice ability to remain motionless. Port Jackson sharks are another nice example. Carpet sharks, another example of sharks that can do this behavior. In contrast, the really big, terrifying, charismatic species of sharks, like white sharks, whale sharks, tiger sharks, bull sharks, these are another group um, that are known as ram ventilating sharks. And they're ram ventilators because in order to ventilate, they have to move continuously and ram seawater through their open mouth over their gills. That's how they breathe. So a great white shark that is not moving risks suffocating because they're not um, exchanging gas with the environment. Um, so we have two sort of main groups of sharks in a sense that differ depending upon their respiratory physiology. Our group has looked at sleep in the buccal pumping sharks because, well, you've got something clearly sleep-like to work. Yeah. So it seemed like a good starting point. So we worked with uh, Port Jackson's and, and draft spored sharks and found that these sharks, they of course have periods of restfulness. That restfulness is associated with reduced responsiveness. They're less aware of the local environment. Um, whether their sleep is regulated, if those sharks are sleep deprived, whether they sleep more, we don't know. The data was fairly unconvincing for that and it needs repeated actually. But importantly, we did also find that sharks that are inactive for five minutes, they have a reduced metabolic rate. Um, and that's consistent with what we see in mammals and in birds and in fruit flies that, um, and in flatworms as well, but that's not published. Um, that when these animals um, are sleeping, they save energy by reducing their metabolic rate. So the buccal pumping sharks seem to be sleeping and that sleep is characterized basically as not moving for five minutes. Whether it's regulated, again, we need to look at this in the future and are doing so um, this year um, on fiddler rays, fiddler rays. Um, however, this other group of sharks, these charismatic ram ventilators, we don't know what they do. Um, it's possible that <laughs> they, they, they don't sleep, although my guess is they do. Why do I say that? Well, it's because every other species that we've studied sleeps in some way. And dolphins can sleep while swimming. Um, seals can sleep unihemispherically while paddling a flipper. So why can't a great white sleep in mm -hmm. some manner and still sleep? But the question is, is if they are sleeping while swimming, how do they do it? Are they sleeping unihemispherically? Um, is there some other kind of local sleep where they just keep a couple of circuits that control the tail back and forth? Um, there is um, a YouTube video that came out from a, a shark researcher in Mexico a few years ago, and they followed a great white um, on near Guadalupe Island with a submersible so they could film it. And... Um, they find that great whites like to come to this Guadalupe Island because um, certain times of the day when the water is going out to sea, it's coming very steeply uh -huh. off the island. And then the animal can go into the water current, open its mouth, gape its mouth, and then the water flows right into its mouth. And it's swimming very slowly, just leisurely moving the tail fin just to keep it in position, but then it's ram ventilating, not by moving itself to the water, but allowing the water to come to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they raise in that YouTube video, it's not a paper, that maybe this is how one of these sharks sleeps. Um, we don't know, but it was an intriguing observation. Um, and also I would add that the shark did not seem aware of the submersible or at the very least, it didn't seem to care about the submersible. Um, so maybe it was doing something more important, like sleeping. But yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question, but one I would like to get into after we explore sleep with these fiddler rays. I think that will then end our work with the buccal pumping sharks. And then I would like to get into the more charismatic ram ventilating sharks. Um, John, for the, for the 
sharks that the, the non ram ventilating sharks that sit on the bottom of the ocean and um, how long will they sit there will they be like like kind of a polyphasic sleeper will they just have would it be like five minutes here five minutes there do we have any idea about cum the kind of sleep patterns and behaviors and cumulatively how much sleep or periods of non-movement will they have in a 24-hour period so this is really variable so in some species um they're very uh nocturnal um sleeping during the day awake at night and it's very very clear during the day they sit there and they do not move really for the course of the day but then others like a dogfish shark um these animals seem much more arrhythmic where their sleep seems to be occurring kind of intermittently across the day and the night with no clear preference towards when it's occurring um so it, it seems to be quite variable but we have data on relatively few species just a couple Fascinating. We just even we just skimmed the surface here of the of the skies and the seas here with you around measure and measuring sleep as well. And it's been absolutely fascinating, John. My final question to you is: You've been doing this work now for probably over twenty years. What, if anything, have have you changed your view on the world about from looking at all these different species? Uh, what surprised me the most um, is that we are told. Um, that there are three pillars to healthy living. These are getting exercise, which I don't do, um, <laughs> healthy eating, which I don't do, and getting enough sleep, eight hours of sleep, which I probably do actually. Um, however, what surprised me most is that when we went and studied these pectoral sandpipers in Alaska, we found not only were some males capable of becoming very, sleeping very, very, very little, you know, perhaps uh, five, 10% per 24 hour day up to three weeks. However, the interesting thing about that system was that the males that were sleeping the least were convincing the most females to mate with them. And they ultimately sired the highest number of offspring. And this was really surprising because we are told that how well you perform while awake depends intimately on how much sleep you get. This was the first example that we had that sleep loss could be evolutionarily adaptive in the truest sense. The less sleep you get, the more offspring you have. And uh, this was quite a surprising thing because I think if you sleep deprived yourself for 21 days, went to the pub and tried to convince anyone to mate with you, you would have a very difficult time going about it. But uh, John, you haven't seen me in action. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to insult you. I should have been oh, talking no. about myself. Oh. My, my wife is listening. Sorry, sorry. No, I would never do that, John. I would never. I have been married for nearly 20 years. I've been with my wife for 23 years. I'm, I'm quite happy here. Thank you very much. End of the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> and uh, so that was the most surprising thing is that here was a case of a bird um, who seemed to disentangle the effects of waking performance and prior sleep history. Mm. Um, how they do that, we have no idea. Um, I'll be going back to the Arctic this year to hopefully provide insight into that in June and July, I'll be back up there. But it was the most phenomenal discovery in, in, in my life anyway. I think that's really interesting because as you said, in humans, and we know from research in humans that basically when people are sleep deprived, you know, acutely over a week or so, even just short term sleep debt or sleep loss, that people basically, we can tell around their eyes and the color. And we've seen, if we've seen their studies have been published that basically people look less attractive or when people get more sleep, they become more attractive to people, you know, under different conditions. So it's, that's really fascinating. But then you're saying that in the birds, the, it basically they'll sleep loss. It's like nearly like a badge of honor. So I wonder, do the females go to this because it's like, it's nearly like you're saying, like an evolutionary thing, like, oh, wow, that bird can get by on sleep loss and it's really tough. It's like a proxy measure for, you know, most, you know, we, it's like maybe, a, a, you know, a woman or a man might, like a woman might potentially see a guy and go, oh, he's really muscular and lean, he's tall and he drives this type of car. So it's a proxy for all these other things. Is the sleep loss maybe being indicative of this? This is a really tough bird that can come up here and do this and last 
Whereas like, you know, if someone didn't, that would be, it's viewed the opposite way. Is that kind of what we're saying here? Yeah, look, we we don't know what females are finding attractive in this system. It could be that the males are simply, because they're awake more, they're more persistent, which means the females <laughs> encourage them yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The females encounter them more, rather, and it could just be that that's what they keep track of. Oh, I've seen him once, I've seen him twice, I've seen him three times, he clears some threshold, and she says yeah, that's yeah. good. Alternatively, maybe she watches him, and she's looking at what he's doing and says, wow, he's He's really going. He must have some really good genes because he's able to forage and maintain a territory and not get eaten by a predator. Yeah, yeah. Really got a suite of traits that I want in my only clutch of the season. I've just flown 18,000 kilometers. I want the best mail that I can get and mm. is it. But specifically what they're queuing into, we actually don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, it's fascinating. John, thank you very much for coming on the podcast there. I really appreciate it. It's great to have a conversation with you. Uh, we did meet, obviously, just briefly at La Trobe before Christmas. We ran into each other in the food court by pure accident. So that was that was quite interesting. So it's great to sit down and have a bit more of an in-depth conversation with you. Before we go, John, um, do you have a website? Do you have any uh, an area where people can follow your work or contact you? Or do you have any sort of social media stuff that you do? Anything you'd like to promote or plug on the podcast today? Uh, sure. So if anybody's interested in learning more about the lab or getting in touch or reading any of my papers, they're all on the lab's website, which is lesqlab.org, L-E-S-K-U lab.org. So check it out. Lesqlab.org. Great stuff. John, thank you very much. I um, really appreciate it. And we'll talk soon. Thanks very much. Take care of yourself, eh?